Well, hey everyone, let's stand up today. Let's put our hands together. We are here to praise Jesus for all that he is, who he is, and what he's done. He's given us a reason to praise him, so let's sing. And I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. And I'll praise when I'm sure, and I'll praise when I'm doubting. And I'll praise when outnumbered, I'll praise when surrounded. My praise is the water that my enemies drown in. And as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul, and praise the Lord, oh my soul. Let's sing this out. And I'll praise when I feel it, and I'll praise when I do. My praise is a weapon, and it's more than a sound. And my praise is the shouts that brings Jericho down. Let's sing this together. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. As we sing, and I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, I'll praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, I'll praise cause there's nobody greater than you, let's sing, praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, I'll praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, I'll praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true.
to go into a time of communion and maybe this is your first time here and I would actually encourage you just to watch or maybe you've been coming for some time and you're trying to figure out this whole Christianity thing I would actually just encourage you to not partake but just to watch what we do and if you are a believer if you are a follower of Jesus this is a good time for us to reflect to give thanks to show gratitude to God for what he who he is and what he's done for us See, 2,000 years ago, God, he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life. And he was falsely accused. He was beaten. He was whipped. And then he was crucified for you and for me. For my sins and for your sins. And even right now, as you look at that cup... That cracker represents Jesus' body being broken for you. That juice it represents his blood being shed for you because he loved you, he cared for you, he wanted you to be in eternity. And so before we partake the elements, I want to give you some time. 
Maybe there's some things on your heart, on your mind that you just gotta confess to God. So just take these next few moments and talk to him because he cares and he wants to know. And ask him for forgiveness because he's willing to forgive you. So this time it's between you and God. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus, he's there with his disciples and they're sharing this meal and he takes some bread and he rips it apart and he hands it to all his disciples and he says, this is my body that's broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, later that night, he would pour some wine and he would give it to his disciples and he would say, drink this, for this is the blood of my new covenant that I'm creating. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus, for the sacrifice that he paid on the cross God, I'm so thankful because of that sacrifice, we are now reunited. And not only are we reunited to you, but God, we also have all of eternity to look forward to. God, I'm so thankful for that sacrifice because it should have been us on that cross. And yet your son, Jesus, he died for us willingly. And God, even as we remember this, even as we partake in this right now, God, how do we not go and tell our friends, our families, our coworkers, our neighbors about what Jesus has done for us? Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. We love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand together? Let's continue to respond and sing about who our God is that he is not dead, but our hope is alive. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night.
them so much because what they describe is a place where you and I weren't. We were so far from God, so separated from God, and it was through that living hope that we have in Jesus that we've been reconnected with our Father. And it's this God that we get to go to right now, and we get to pray to Him. And what we want to pray for is our winter student camps. It's pretty awesome. I just came back last weekend. We had our middle school winter camp, and it was awesome. We had 155 middle schoolers come up there. And I mean, the whole, oh, we could clap for that, absolutely. It was amazing. But it was so cool. I mean, this whole weekend, you have these kids, they're coming up there. They have their friends, they're worshiping, they're reading their Bibles. They're hearing God's word. And then on Saturday night, we had an altar call night. And we had over 60 students come up to the altar and drop on their knees and give their lives to Christ and to recommit their lives to Christ. And next week, we have our high schoolers going up there. And so on the screen behind me right now, there's a few ways that we can be praying for our student winter camps. But here's one thing I do want to remind you. A lot of those kids, they're gonna go up there and they're gonna make big commitments this weekend, life-changing commitments. And so would you pray that the commitments that they make, that they would stick with them and that God would continue to change their lives? This time it's between you and God, and then I'll close this here. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all of our student winter camps. I think about the middle schoolers who already went up there and who made these commitments. And I pray, God, that these kids, these commitments that they would make, that they would stick to them. And then also, God, this next week in our high schoolers who are gonna go up there. And God, I know that they're gonna make some life-changing commitments just like the middle schoolers did. And I pray that you would give them the boldness, that you would give them the strength to stick with those commitments. God, this is the next generation who's gonna carry the torch of bringing your gospel to other people. And so God, be with them. Thank you for this time. Thank you for who you are. We love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, you may be seated. 
Well, welcome to The Bridge. My name is Dana. I'm the campus pastor here. And if this is your first time, thank you so much for, me, uh, for joining us. Our mission here at The Bridge is to connect you to God, to people, and to service. And we, we hope that that happens for you. Matter of fact, we would love to connect with you right now. And if so if you pull out your phone and scan that QR code that's on the screen behind me or in the bulletin in front of you, this will take you to our Connect card. Fill this Connect card out with as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. If you're a first-time guest, that could just be your name and any information that you feel comfortable giving us. If you're a returning guest, that could just be your name and any information that might have changed. There's also a couple of boxes that you can check and a place for prayer requests. And please put something down. We would love to pray for you. Our team, they meet here every single Tuesday and we go over every single request. And then also through that QR code, I want you to know that you can give But if this is your first time here, please don't feel obligated to give. This is really for those who call the bridge home. We'll have some offering buckets on the way out. As you walked into the auditorium today and as you sat down, you probably saw one of those network cards on your chair. As a matter of fact, I want all of us to pick up that network card right now because I just want to hit on that real quick. The network is this amazing ministry that we have here. And what it does, it's basically this email system that we have that we can provide meal trains to people so that we can shovel people's driveways who can't dr- shovel their driveways. And it's basically a way that not only we get involved in our community, but as the church, now we actually be- get to be the hands and feet of Jesus and we get to go out and we get to serve people. And so what we're hoping to do today, tonight, is actually to have around 50 people in here sign up to be part of the network. And how this works, if there's a need or something that comes into the church, I send that need out to our email network, which would be you guys. And then from there, you just let me know if you can do it. And if you can't, that's okay. But what an awesome serving opportunity we have. And so don't miss out on the network. If you wanna be a part of that, make sure you check out one of those cards. And then here's a couple more things we have coming up at the bridge. Hi, I'm Maddie, and here's what's happening at the bridge. Are you new to the bridge? If you answered yes, then Bridge 101 is for you. This two-week class is your next step to find out more about who we are and where we're going as a church. Our next class is February 18th and 25th. Sign up on our website. We're excited to offer purity groups for both men and women starting this Tuesday, February 6th. Purity is something that every one of us either struggles with or at least works hard at. These groups aren't just about fixing problems, although we will do that. They're also about prevention, meaning everyone in our church should look to join these groups. Visit thebridge.church slash purity to learn more and get signed up today. Looking for practical help and proven steps for raising students in their teenage years? The Parenting Teens class is for you. Pastor Scott and Pastor Brian are hosting a four-week class that will help you a ton. God has great advice on how to parent in these difficult years. Clear off four Monday evenings starting February 12th at Displains or Ranters and make plans to be there. Learn more and sign up at thebridge.church slash parenting. Are you looking to grow in your marriage? Register for our two-day marriage conference on Friday, February 16th and Saturday, February 17th. Whether you're struggling or just want to get better, this will be life-changing for you. We are looking forward to learning from Drs. Bob and Pam McRae, professors at Moody Bible Institute, who will be sharing practical steps you can take to improve your marriage. If you're married, engaged, or single and just want to learn, register today for our marriage conference. That's it for today. Please grab your phone right now and put it on silent. If you need to take it out of your purse or pocket, go for it. It really helps us create an amazing atmosphere. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of the service. So growing up for me, when it comes to punishment, okay, when I was a kid was not too tough. So I don't know, you can think back to your own childhood right now. I had it pretty good. Uh, I didn't get punished a lot. Probably could have used a little more now that you know me like this. But, but I didn't get a lot. I never really got grounded, never, never got in trouble a whole lot. I was a pretty good kid, I was. But I did have it pretty easy. But my wife, now she was also a good kidder. That's what she says. Jury's out. 
But she got punished uh, quite a bit. And sometimes the punishment wouldn't always match the crime. And maybe that was your childhood, right? You felt like it was a little bit too much. Uh, she had the soap in the mouth. One time, anybody ever had that in here by hand? Yeah, maybe you're watching at home. You're doing it right now. Your kid just mouthed off, putting soap in there. And uh, My favorite story of her all, all time with punishment as a kid was uh, they would go to Disney World all the time. They lived in Florida. And so the season passes were super cheap if you lived there. So they would go. And she and her sister were getting at each other, her next oldest sister, Bree. So at some point, I don't know, but at some point in the day, mom was like, okay, that's it. You have to hold hands for the rest of the day. So they walked around the Magic Kingdom, y'all, holding hands all day, every ride, every line, while they ate. They had to hold hands all day. To... A little bit much, but I think it's kind of funny because it didn't happen to me, so cool. So then the biggest thing, I think, for her from her stories as a kid was she was the first, second, and third ever boy-girl fight in her middle school. First fight ever between a boy and a girl, second, and then she finished it off with a third. Now, she wants me to mention that she won all of them. So I got you, okay. She'll be here tomorrow. But uh, so she won all of them, but she was always defending somebody. So it was always the boy was bullying another boy and she would beat up the boy to defend him. So really awesome, I, I think. But it was, she would always get in trouble anyway. In fact, by the third time it happened, the principal uh, met with my mother-in-law, Kathy, and said, Kathy, like, I even get it that she's doing this, but I, I still have to punish her. And we can think, oh, was it justice or not? I don't know. But so many times as children and maybe even as adults, we get these punishments. We think, man, that's a little bit too much. And when I read the Bible, I'm, I, I think the same thing. I read the Old Testament and I, I look at the law sometimes and I think, what? If they do this, they're gonna get stoned? If they do this, you're gonna cut their hand off? And you start reading the Bible, you're like, man. In fact, a lot of people I think can read the Bible and just think in general that God's too harsh. Not even just what happens, but that he himself is too harsh. And I think a little bit that we're gonna, we're gonna feel that today. But I'm gonna invite you to push through that feeling. I'm gonna invite you to, to get through it and see the why behind what happened in the story that we're gonna look at. We're in Acts chapter four. We're gonna do the end of it and then we're gonna go on to five. So we're gonna end four and go on to five. So pull out your Bible, grab your phones or grab the blue Bible if you want to in our rows there. We got sermon notes in the back of your bulletin. We got sermon notes in the bridge app. So lots of ways to stay connected, stay tuned in and follow along. But we're starting at the end of chapter four because we really needed to understand chapter five. Does that make sense? Like a lot of you don't know this or we don't think about it, but the chapters really weren't put in until about the 1400s. These are just letters. These are just long. It's nice. It's super helpful, right? The verses came later. It's really nice to be able to look something up now rather than like, dude, find it in Psalms. Good luck, right? It's kind of nice to have this, but some of the breaks aren't quite where they maybe make the most sense. And this is one of them. This story that we're gonna hear today, I always heard it growing up as a kid in this church, but I never heard it with the end of four first. And I think it's gonna give us a lot of context. But let me pray for us and we'll start, okay? God, thank you for every man and woman and student in this room. God, I pray that we would sit up a little bit tonight. If we're watching online, I pray we lean forward a little bit in our chair, driving in our car, wherever we are, God, that we would recognize that you're big enough to talk to all of us. You have something for each one of us. This isn't for the person next to us. It's not just for Brian. It's not just for someone else. It's for each of us. And God, we pray that you would help us lower the wall of pride that we carry around so, so high and just say, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I know a bit, but the truth is compared to you, I'm a long ways off. So if you have something for me, help me, God, to be open to it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Outside the city of Jerusalem, two fresh graves sit. It's a husband, wife, and the cause of their death is unknown, and the details surrounding their death are somewhat mysterious, maybe even scandalous. And the story of these two as the town talking, wondering, some don't even want to talk about it because it's pretty unnerving. Despite all that, these two fresh graves lay there, fresh dirt and new stones, almost sticking up as warning signs 
to everybody about what's happened. And the wild part is the story of this couple's demise starts out so beautifully. It was just weeks ago, the husband and wife were loving their church community. They got baptized. They probably joined a, a group of people in a home and would break bread together and they would gather with the church and they would do what we just did and lift their hands and worship. And they were giving money and they were praying and they made these new friends and they were calling them family. Does that sound familiar? So many of us, right? They were just us. Y'all, they were just a couple and they're just living their lives. So how could it end like this? Two graves, life over. Well, look at 32. Here we go. 432 in Acts. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. So like everybody's agreeing, not on everything. I don't even agree with Michelle on everything. But as a church, they were in pretty good agreement on the majors. They had defined what's really important to us. What do we believe here? It's gonna be hard for us today, right? So many in the church and maybe at your job too, you, you get focused on the littlest things and that causes dissension and division. This church, God's like, Luke's like, hey, listen, they had everything. They were one heart and one soul. Go back to your Bible. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And people sometimes look at those verses and say, so is this socialism? Like, is that what this is? No, because socialism, or even take it further, com it's like communism, which has been awful to Christianity, so it's not that. But even socialism, socialism is pushed on us, right? Socialism is you have to share. This wasn't that. This was the believers just saying, we want it. In fact, it's not just we want to share. It's like, I don't even view this stuff as mine. The house, for us, the car, the money, the land, for them, the animals. They, they had nothing in their possession that they said, well, it's mine. It was just, it was everybody's. And they all had everything together. Skip ahead to verse 36. I'll even put it up here. Then Joseph, thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, paused there. So we're introduced to Barnabas. And we're going to see a lot about Barnabas in the weeks ahead as we go through Acts. We're going to follow him on some of his journeys and we're going to get to know him better. But his name is Joseph, but the apostles give him a new name, Barnabas. Why? Why'd they do that? Well, we'd like to think a little bit was because that was something Jesus did. He liked giving nicknames or even new names. He said to Simon, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna call you Peter because you're gonna be a rock for me, man. He said to James and John when they would <laughs> lose their temper, he would calm them down and he nicknamed them the sons of thunder. Something Jesus liked to do was give nicknames. It was endearing. Right? I even thought back to this last week, Ken and Barb, Ken and Barbie, uh, right? We're up on our screen and shared their story. It was so, so awesome. In fact, if you missed last week, you talk, uh, talk about a marriage that about fell apart around my age. And then he comes to Christ and she comes to Christ seven years later. And their marriage since then is just unbelievably fantastic. And so if you didn't see that, it's on our homepage and it's on our YouTube. It's really worth watching. But they talked, you remember they talked at the end about their nicknames? He was ironically called Joseph, which he's never understood. And then she, what did he call her? Do you remember? Mouse. And he's sick because she has a squeaky voice. That was funny. I liked that. But this is what the apostles are doing. Joseph is now nicknamed the son of encouragement. Could that be your nickname? A little side note. If people gave you that nickname, would they snicker? Do you lift people up when you speak? Are you an encourager? Or would it be like, you no, know that, not that guy. Don't, don't call him that, Barnabas. And Barnabas sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, maybe you've been around a while, you, you might put two and two together here and say, hold on, the last verse said he was a Levite and Levites are the priests and the priests don't have land. So what's the deal? Is this guy... Some people have said, well, was he disobeying? So he had land and we knew he sells it kind of secretly. Or, I don't think so. If you go back to 36, where we just were, it said he was from Cyprus. That's not in Israel. So he can have land in Cyprus. I'm always jealous of people here who have, maybe some of you have land in Europe. I meet so many people who have land in Greece or Italy from their, right? Especially in Chicago, those two countries especially. 
handed down. And so they've got this vineyard or they've just got this plot of land. I'm so jealous. You all can give that to me if you want. But he's got this, somehow Barnabas has this land on Cyprus. Maybe he was gonna retire there. Like maybe he was gonna go there someday. We don't know. But this guy, listen, he sells it and he gives all the money to the church. What? I'm not doing that. He sells it and he gives all the money to the church. Maybe I should do it. No doubt the story spread. Did you hear what Barnabas did? That guy's legit. And I'm sure at some point, a couple, a husband and wife, caught wind of this. And they were inspired to do the same thing. And maybe, maybe for a moment, they were inspired to do it the right way rather than what we're gonna see. But at some point, part of them wanted the attention that comes with the gift. Maybe even more than the gift. Now look at chapter five. Here's the good stuff, but the weird stuff. But, okay, that's why we started in four. Because, so Barnabas did this, but this. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. This is where the music gets real low. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, big disclaimer. Listen, the failure here is not that they gave the wrong amount. As we can quickly think, well, God's gonna kill me if I don't give the right amount of money. Is that what we're talking about? No, that's not what's going on. The sin is that they misrepresented what they gave. Barnabas gave everything, and somehow in the story, if we had been there, Ananias and Sapphira come with that same, we did the same thing. We just did the same thing. Can you give us a nickname? We did the same thing. Put our name in the Bible. We did the same thing. Here's all the money for our land. But secretly, there was more going on. They wanted this image of giving it all, being good church people. But at home, it was not the case. The scary part is even right here as we pause. Um, this happens at different levels all the time. We go to church. We can go to small group or classes. We can. I'm not talking about them anymore. You're talking about you and me. We can go to these places and look like, man, we got it all together. Look at my cute marriage. Look at my great family. Good Christian at home and work. And home and work is a freaking disaster. It's not true at all. But nobody knows. The truth is the marriage is really messy. The truth is the tempers often flare up. The truth is you've been looking at porn. The truth is you keep fighting. You keep flirting with that coworker. The truth is the kids are a disaster and they never come home. There's bitterness and the only thing bringing you together with your spouse is when you complain about somebody else. And you curse at work and you raise your voice like I'm doing. And you cheat on your hours, just a couple more even though I know I left. And you gossip around the water cooler. But none of that ever comes up, does it? Not when we're here. Not when you're at your small group. You go to see a counselor. Oh, that stuff's all for me. Work doesn't know home. Home doesn't know church. You see, our first point today, it comes right out of looking at these two and ourselves. Hypocrisy kills. Mark Twain wrote that we're all like the moon. We got this dark side. Isn't this true? This dark side we don't want anyone to see. And even scarier, when you look at this phrase, what's really scary is like everyone in this room, rarely does a sermon you can say everyone. Everyone in this room knows how to do this. Everyone in this room can flip this on. I know how. I can get up here and act like I'm perfect. I got that down. I can teach here or other weeks if I'm over here and I'm singing, I can lift my hands and get through three songs without thinking about God once. And saying things that are so good and then walking out of here, not doing them. I can do that. Can you do that? I'm just saying I can do it. Now, I don't want to do it. I fight it because hypocrisy kills. So I don't want to be that. I want to have super high integrity in my marriage and with my kids and in my home and in this church and even with the position I have here. Do you? Do you want to fight it that hard? Do you know that it kills you and the people around you. Hypocrisy kills. Because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm sure that's you. 
To make it worse, we live in this age where it's very normal to live Div, to, to portray a different life than you have. It is normal to put up the cute, perfect marriage and the cute kids on Instagram or post a video on TikTok of you like having a blast with your friends and, but you're all just a mess in reality. Kind of like this, we take these selfies and that was me yesterday. Man, I'm getting old, y'all. It's 44 going on 80 or 90 the wrinkles, look at this. So, so I tried to make it a little bit better. All right, we're getting there, you know, a little something, something there. And then I sent it to our comms team and I said, could you get rid of my wrinkles? <laughs> this is what they said. <laughs> now, what I don't understand is why did, why did my lips get so pink? What does that have to do with my wrinkles? Anyway, but we show this kind of not... Thanks, production. Appreciate it. We show this kind of not normal photo. Listen, there's some of you who put photos up. It doesn't even look like you. What are we doing? It's become so normal in our world to put on a face now literally to hide who we really are. But here's what's cool. Think about it this way. When we live in a world like that, man, if we're real, we're going to stand out. We're gonna be the only ones. Plus the fake pretense is exhausting. You ever find yourself I mean, with, with certain friends maybe in your life or work friends, definitely networking events where everyone's trying to compete. Man, it's just like the whole time is like fake and there's name dropping going on and you leave that gathering exhausted. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I'll leave and be like, dang it, I was part of it. Like, I don't even wanna do that. But you get sucked into it and it's like, oh, I hate that. You ever, you ever been there for real? Just, I'm just leaving friends and being like, I'm so tired of putting up a front tonight. But then you got a few friends, and I hope you do. And if you don't, there's some right here in these seats. Push through the awkward and get to know some people around here. Man, I hope your Christian friends are your best friends. Because I hope they're the people who are just who they are all the time. No competition, no pretense. When you hang out with them, you're not trying to one-up each other. Man, you're just hanging out. I love you, man. God made you. I don't need to prove anything. You don't need to prove anything, man. Just be you. And we're all growing together. Man, those are the kind of friendships, at least for me, y'all, I love. It's funny because we gravitate toward those people. You ever notice that? Is that you? Like we gravitate toward authenticity, but then sin messes with us. So we try to be fake, but we want authentic. So why don't we just be authentic? Why don't we just be real all the time? Hypocrisy kills so it's worth asking the question, and we'll ask it again later, but let's ask it now. Where is the hypocrisy in you? Like, think about your life right now. All the levels. Where do you feel a pull to withhold the real you and fake it? The context where you're trying to impress. Where are you deflecting? Where do you tend to point the finger the most? Because oftentimes, this is a good point, oftentimes hypocrites can tend to be critics so where are you complaining the most? Where are you like restless and putting down others because you don't really want to look at what's going on here? Was it true? So true of the Pharisees in Jesus' time. Talk about hypocrites. He said, woe to you, hypocrites. He literally called them that. But they were always pointing the fingers at everybody else. Because if I can walk around and find everything wrong with that group of people or my job or my church, maybe it'll deflect the issues that I'm dealing with. Where are you critical, deflecting? Where are you a hypocrite? And then the story here, it's something that God can't let fester in the early stages of the church. It's a cancer he must cut. And the punishment seems more than harsh. This is worse than soap in the mouth or hold your sister's hand. You ready? Verse three. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? I love these questions. While it remained unsold, didn't it remain your own? And, and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Like, dude, you were in total control here. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You haven't lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Y'all catch that? Bro, die, right? If one of you comes up here and dies tonight, it's gonna freak me out. 
all right? And some people will say, man, I wish we lived in the time of Acts. Like, I'd love to see more miracles. I'd love to see Brian or Scott or Junior or Denim like perform miracles. Do you really want the book of Acts now that you've seen this part? Isn't it good that this isn't normative? This isn't normal. But this guy dies. He says, you didn't lie to man. Like so many of us think, ah, I'm just putting on a front for everybody else. No, no, you lied to God, Ananias. And he dies. I'm glad he doesn't do it because we had this, you know, you were doing the network just now and we were filling that card and, you know, we have ushers and greeters and bridge kids and production and worship. What if we had grave diggers was one of the things you all could sign up for. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Jeff, you could be a grave digger. And yeah, and so when you come in here, and this is Junior's, I love it. He says, when we sing, I surrender all, if you actually sing it and don't mean it, all those people die. And then, so Jeff, you'd be pretty busy on those days and, I mean, this is what we're talking, this is crazy. And this is what happens. <laughs> Interesting point for us. There's grace in God's punishment. See, this isn't normal. God is gracious with us, so what's the deal? Like, hold on, Brian, so you're saying that there's grace in this moment? The husband and wife were killed for something that I'm guilty of all the time. I don't see any grace here. Yeah, but the key is context, right? Context is everything in our lives, in the scripture. And when we don't look at context, we can often misinterpret scripture, or even abuse it. So the key is context. So what's the context? Well, the context is the church right here is experiencing incredibly deep community. And people are getting along as we talked about. They're encouraging each other. They're sharing. There's no competition. There's no pretense. There's no image, no complaining. There's no drama. And they're reaching more and more people with the gospel and the good news of Jesus. And there's this one bad apple in the bunch. It spoils, as you know, it can spoil the whole thing. This couple wants to be highlighted. They want the attention. They want their image to be bigger than it is. And God knows it just takes one person like that to ruin this community of 12,000 plus people and reach, uh, and its reach to the lost. So God removes the bad apple to save the bunch and the future bunch. It's one of the reasons why there's grace in it because it preserves his people. Oh, it's harsh to Ananias and Sapphira for sure. But on the other end, it's also gracious to the rest. It's gracious to this future bunch that would have felt this sin infecting the whole. To preserve something precious calls for sometimes drastic action. We see this on a very small level uh, today. Uh, you know the whole like shoe craze going on right now, right? It's been going on for a few years. People wearing hundred dollars, thousands of dollars worth on a pair of shoes. But in the winter, it gets kind of hard, right? So they end up walking around like this. And it, it's like the couches that some of you grew up on, right? With the plastic, or the plastic around the lamp. That's so stupid. I could wear Crocs under that. Nobody gonna know. I don't even know it's 500 bucks. And it's a silly example, but it, it, it makes sense. Like when we think, like that guy thinks that shoe is so important. So he buys a covering for it and puts it on like a moron and walks around the streets. God looks at this thing. He says, listen, what we've started here, what my son died for, this is too precious. And he takes drastic measures to preserve something he loves. That's, it's, it's us. And if Ananias and Sapphira were true believers, if they were, so it could have been for sure. And the moment they died, they were in a far better place than this place. So they wouldn't come back. But the main thing is that the cancer is cut from the church, saving that church and its future. Uh, a couple years ago, a guy left our church because there's a phrase I think we had said it up front. I've said it off stage before. And, and that is that a lot of churches are one funeral away from being a growing church. Sink in. Got it? Kind of mean a little bit, but, but true. We're really fortunate here at the bridge. Uh, we don't deal with this, but I, I work with a lot of churches on the side. And I'm gonna tell you, it sounds harsh, but there are some small churches where there's a couple people or a few people or one person who are stiff-necked and critical and dragging their feet and doing everything they can to make sure that we don't reach a new person. And that church is one funeral away from growing. It just is. 
He said, Brian, that's so mean. It's true. In fact, it's true here. Like, then God's mean. Because it's true right now. God is cutting, cutting out the cancerous attitude. And it should cause us to look at ourselves, this whole message. What are we spreading? Like, like I said earlier, are we Barnabas? Are, are you? Don't think about we. Are you? Am I? You spread encouragement when you speak. Life. Or are you Ananias or, or Sapphira? You're competing, image-driven. You're a hypocrite. Which character are you? Because there's a lot of Ananiases and Sapphiras today. So really, why doesn't God, why doesn't he just kill us? Like I made the jokes, but like, why don't some of us die tonight? C context again. This moment here that we're looking at in Acts is very, very, very unique, thank God. It's this pivotal moment for the church. The church has yet to duplicate. Do you know that? We've talked about this here, you know, the, some of the anti-megachurch stuff that goes on. It's like, that's what's going on right here. It's a megachurch. It's 12,000 people, one church. And you got this megachurch and it's about to birth more churches. And if, that, if, if they birth when it's unhealthy, that will replicate that toxicity. There's certain instances we know with pregnant women where doctors are working with them to get them healthier before they give birth. So the birth goes well. And the same thing's happening here. The church is about to give birth, but it must be healthy. Like if it's gonna go from Jerusalem and spread and spread in 2024, here we are. We gotta protect it. You gotta cut out cancer. Verse five, the second half says, great fear came upon all who heard it. You think? Yeah. You ever see somebody deal with really heavy consequences and it sobers you up? Maybe you've flirted with drugs before or you're interested in taking them and then you have a friend overdose. We've had people overdose in this church. It's terrible. It's, it's awful. Maybe you've cheated at work before. Maybe you've cheated like on your taxes just a little bit. And every year, here we come again now, coming up on April 15th and you just wanna move a couple numbers. But then you have a friend who actually gets audited and gets totally screwed because it catches up to him. Maybe you're tough, always looking to pick a fight. Man, if somebody bring, bring it on, let's go. Then we look at that story, I think it was in Buffalo, but it was in one of the stadiums a couple months ago. Did you see when the guy died? When the two guys got in a fight at the football game? The videos were online. You're drunk, got in a fist fight, punched the guy, killed him, and he's going to jail for homicide for a long time. That's a sobering thought if you're a fighter. It's a sobering thought to be like, oh, oh, this is a big deal. And this is what these people are feeling. Verse six, the young men rose, they came in, they wrapped up Ananias, carried him out and buried him. After about three hours, his wife comes in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me, you sell the land for so much? And she said, yeah, for so much. Man, notice the grace here. Peter's giving her another chance. It's funny how the culture affects me. Uh, I, when I first read this and, and over the years, I've actually, I don't, maybe you just thought this. I was like, dude, come on, man. You're like setting her up. Did anybody think that? I'm like, come on, man. Just tell her husband's dead. He lied. How much have we been, like blame shifting is like ingrained in me. Peter is showing grace here. When did it become wrong to ask someone to tell you the truth? So I had to write in my mind, like, no, this is so gracious of Peter. Okay, because he knows, okay, your husband's dead, but you got, you got a shot. You got a shot. Did you sell your land for this much? Like the amount he said? Yeah. But Peter said to her, verse nine, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those guys who buried your husband are at the door and they're gonna carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last when the young men came in, they found her dead, carried her out, buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. It's a repeat of verse five. Great fear fell upon them. And when something's repeated, it's important. We gotta dig into this. See, the second sub point to that God's punishment is gracious thing. 
It's because it sobers his people. It's okay to have a little fear. Yeah. That was the point of all my examples. It's okay to be like, oh, I didn't know if I smoked that, I was gonna go there. Yeah, that's what happens. Oh. So all these people see them fall. And what are they thinking immediately? I'm sure they were like, wow, I can't believe that happened. But also like, dude, 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 what did I do? What did I do today? What did I do today? What did I do today? Sobers his people. The word Luke uses for fear is the Greek word phobos. And it means this profound respect for someone or something. And there's this, he's saying, listen, there's this healthy fear that we should have of God that drives our respect. You know, sometimes we're a little too loose. The man upstairs, right? The big guy. God's our friend. And the Bible says he's our friend, but we'll throw that out there a little too casually. Even our prayers, I think sometimes are so casual. Instead of, while we should be conversational, he loves us. And we can approach the throne with confidence, boldly. He's still God. And so there's this respect that should be in us because in scripture, anytime someone catches a glimpse of God's power or even sees one of his angels, what happens? They're terrified. They're terrified. They're quickly sobered. You ever get sobered on something? Maybe one of the examples I gave, but maybe, maybe something else. I like feeling small. I, I need it. I need it. I like talking to people about the three kind of ways, best ways in my world, in my mind to feel small. Mountains, water, or the sky. And I'll often ask people, many of us on staff have talked about this before. Like what's, and you can think about your own right now. Like what's your, wow, God is God place. I can lay down at night and, and look up at the stars. Sometimes I'll go out with my buddy Jeff out to his place out by the Mississippi. It's pitch dark out there. And we look up at the stars and I'm just, here's what blows me away in my mind. I go, I know from science that that star I'm looking at, even one of the millions, is huge. And it's so little to my eye. That blows me away. God made it. Mountains for me and some of, these, some of my friends, Mike has said, that, hey, that's my place, man. Well, for me, I, yeah, it's great. I get up there in the mountains and I look at those and I literally picture God going boom, boom, boom. And God putting these mountains in place and those are like, wow, he made that, it's the beauty of mountains, right? Right, y'all been there? Yeah. But for me, water's number one. Uh, my in-laws live on the ocean down there in Florida, uh, or on the coast. And so we get to go down there. And, and for me, that's where God's like really, really big. And when I sit on sand and just stare at the ocean and hear the wave come in and just, whoop, whoop, I'm just blown away. And when, I, when it really gets me is, I don't know if this happened to you, when you see like, a, like waves that are coming out of a storm, so like six feet, eight feet, here's what I usually think. If I walked in there right now, it would suck me under and I'd be dead. And to God, this wave is like, Everything I can see, I, I look and all the way to the horizon, as far as I can see is water. And to God, he could just go like this and pick it up. And y'all, I feel so small in the best way. Because it's not Brian trying to be cool. It's not trying to be awesome. Brian's trying to be good at all the things. People like him. It's not all that sin crap in our lives. It's gone, isn't it? You ever have that moment? You sit there and you go, I get it. Little, little me is loved by you? That's messed up, but thank you. I don't know why you love me, but you do. And I've, I've got it. And in that moment, and I try to bring that back with me and live like that, because in that moment, I get it. I am sobered to my size. See, God knows that you're at your best when you're sobered to his greatness, to his might. That's why I think there should be element of fear even in worship. When, when up here leading, when I was in the front row here tonight just singing, like I wanted to put my hands up. For me, it's a sign of surrender. And I know not all the personalities in here, like you don't necessarily do that, but if someone had a gun to you, you'd do it. So why don't you willingly do it? God, I surrender. Like I get it. How small I am, how big you are, I got it. 
It's the healthiest posture to take. And that's what this church feels. And, and listen, this is so cool. It ends up being a really good sobering because a few verses later, they're growing again. Yeah, the one where the two people died, yeah, that faith, yeah, it's drawing people like crazy. It's growing again, addition by subtraction. God powerfully removes the problem, it sobers them, and now they're ready to grow. You're at your best, I'm at my best, when we wake up with this reality every day. Again, God seems harsh here, but his punishment is grace, gracious. It preserves the church, we've said. It sobers his people. But may we not forget that not too far from the two graves is an empty grave, right? That Jesus, the third point inside that point is Jesus took the full punishment. And who are we? Who are you? And who am I? To look at God and say, you're harsh. When he's the one who took our place, like he's the one who humbled himself and came down here and goes and gets tortured and dies on a cross. And you and I are gonna look up at him and say, you're too harsh? I'm the mess. I'm just thankful he's rescued me. Jesus took the full punishment. See, we mess up our lives when we forget who God is and who we are. He's great and mighty and the author of life itself. You know, you look up at those stars and he made those huge stars, but he also like put my DNA together. Knit me at the smallest level that we'll never ever see. I don't care how good science gets. We'll never see the level God can do. He's got the littlest thing. He's got the biggest thing. He tells lightning where to strike, points the wind in the direction to blow. He orchestrates the migrations and who's going where. And here we are, these tiny creatures on earth, dust. It's amazing that God gives us a chance to even take one breath, yet he breathes life into these fragile lungs. And somehow we find the audacity to stand before the creator and defy him. And he can and should snuff us into eternal torment, but instead, he's the one who said, no, I'm gonna take it on me. Psalm 40 says, he lifts us out of the miry clay and sets our feet on a solid rock. And again, so many times, I'll just admit, I stand on that rock and I say, look at how good Brian is. I got it so together, man. And you just gotta go, no, what? Scott often talks with us, Pastor Scott, our lead pastor, about like, why are you on that rock anyway? Because Jesus put you there. You didn't do nothing. Not all the talents we have in this room, everything you do at your job, everything you think, every strategy you come up with, every instrument you can play, none of it is yours. It's all God's. And he puts this amazing life into us and allows us to live it out but we get so caught up working on our image and wanting to look like we got it all together, wanting to be liked, wanting to be loved and blah, blah, blah. Who are we to not be just utterly honest about ourselves? You see, with the right perspective, I look at this story and I don't say, wow, it's so harsh. I really do look. By the time I'm here with you guys, and I know you've had to play catch up because I've been working on it for a while, but you're just here now. But, but catch up to me. It's full of grace. I mean, God can do whatever he wants. I deserve hell. Like, I can say that. It's not cliche. Like, do you ever think that? Like, I had to really think that when I was practicing getting ready for this. I deserve hell. I deserve eternal separation from God because of the things I think, the things I say, and the things I do, period. And so do you. And so let's be blown away at the fact that our God beckons us, desires us, loves us. So what? So what? I think it's pretty simple tonight. I'm just gonna ask the question we asked earlier. Where are you playing the hypocrite? Where are you playing the hypocrite? Is it, is it here? Like, do you put on this image when you come into this building? Whatever campus you go to, the bridge, or maybe you're watching and you go somewhere else. Like, when you go to church, is that you? 
Are you at home and acting like work's going so well, but it's really falling apart? Are you at work acting like everything's great at home, but you and your spouse are about to get a divorce? You're a hypocrite. And, and, and again, I can't put this on you, but I'm just saying for Brian, like, I don't wanna be that. So I wanna give you 30 seconds to reflect and think, and then actually Jonathan's gonna come and he's gonna sing over you. I'm gonna ask us during the 30 seconds for starters to just be really quiet. Don't move, don't click, don't close your Bible, just sit. Because we're rarely still. And even when Jonathan sings over us, let's just keep our heads down and our eyes closed and just listen to him. He'll invite you to sing eventually. But let's not distract ourselves. Let's definitely not distract someone else. Let's be sober because we're, we're coming before this holy God and we're saying, God, I don't wanna be that. Because once he brings to mind where you are that, I hope you switch to, God, I don't wanna be that. And maybe you'll make a commitment to change. Let's bow our heads. God, in this moment, we give you this time. It's yours. You show us what we need to see in ourselves. Take this time, reflect. Oh 
If you are a first-time guest, thank you so much for joining us on your way out. Make sure you stop by our welcome desk. Our team and I, we would love to meet you and to give you a first-time guest gift. Also, on your way out, there's going to be those offering buckets if you guys need those. And I know in the announcement, they also talked about the purity group. I do want to invite you to the purity group. And a lot of people, they'll come to me and they'll be like, is the purity group only for people struggling with purity? No. I mean, it's for people who want to stay pure, who want to have more tools to their belt so that they could fight against purity. And a lot of those people who come, it's because they've been having a life that's pure. But maybe there's some of us in, who, in here who've been struggling with that, and so I encourage you. Man, come to the class this Tuesday. It could be the start of a life-changing year for you. And then also those network cards, as you guys leave out of here, make sure you drop those into the bucket. Our prayer counselors, I would love to invite our prayer counselors up right now. These men and women, they would love to pray for you about anything. Maybe it's something, maybe it's a question about faith. Maybe it's something you heard in the sermon. And then before you get out of here, would you turn to the person next to you and say hello? I hope you have a great day and God bless.